Well, welcome. This is the 68th episode of Women on Wealth. And today is going to be a little bit of a twist, which is actually making me a little anxious. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, or a couple of episodes, excuse me, um, ago, I interviewed Jen Grace, who is founder of Publish Your Purpose. And we talked about becoming a first time author. And I referenced on that podcast that I was working on my first book as well. And as we release this podcast in February of 2024, I will also have available my book, Money Confident Girls for Sale. And Jen was kind enough to come back and interview me on this. So Jen, nice to see you again. It's nice to see you too. I'm I'm <laughs> happy to to talk about your book on your podcast. I think this is gonna be fun. Yeah. It's I'm I'm anxious, but I'm excited. And I, I would say so if the listeners haven't heard the podcast where I interviewed you, I would recommend going back to Publish Your Purpose, which was released on 1226 of 2023. And just a really quick reintroduction of you. So Jen, Publish Your Purpose has now published 200 books. Is that right? Just shy. Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank um, you. And most of the authors are entrepreneurs, owners, speakers, memoirists. You have been featured in Forbes, Huffington Post, Wall Street Journal, CNBC, and you're an award-winning author yourself and just published, I think, your seventh book. I did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with all that said, I am going to, I guess, hand the reins over to you. <laughs> I can see the the trepidation in your eyes. I promise it's, this is going to be a fun conversation. But, but you're used to seeing this from me over the last couple of years <laughs> with this process, right? This has been one I've been pretty hesitant about. So yeah. And I think, you know, just pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. I think that's a good lesson for listeners, whatever the, the the thing that they're tackling. In this case, we're talking about a book, but you know, in order to see success, sometimes we really have to push ourselves and that's not comfortable. It's not a place of comfort. Yes, exactly. So I would say this was one of those. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but you know, one of the things that you are comfortable around is what you do, right? Like you have this podcast, you wrote this book, you are orbiting this world of helping create financially confident women, girls, it's money, confident girls is the name of the book. And so to start us off in the conversation and a, a question that you will have a very easy answer to, like what inspired you to do this? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. I It's stemming from the creation of this podcast. So this podcast started back in 2020 when I joined uh, Principal Wealth Partners. And the founder of the firm, Bob Paolucci, who's been on this podcast many times talking about the markets and the economy, he said to me, I really think you should have a podcast. And my first answer was, you're insane. And, and I think the reason he said it was because I spent 20 years speaking about the markets and the economy, and I really liked that part of my role in finance. And uh, and he said, no, just think about it. And I did. And funny enough, very quickly, I came to the conclusion that I really wanted to educate women on finance. So that was the creation of Women on Wealth. What transpired from there was it, it started in the pandemic. I had no idea where to go, who to interview, what to do. And so someone else had recommended go on LinkedIn and interview professional women that are outside of finance. And I thought that was insane because I know you're on LinkedIn too. We, you know, people reach out to us all the day. There's some type of sales motivation. I didn't think it would be well received. And I was, I was wrong. I was very wrong on that. I ended up interviewing about 150 women. I did start interviewing men as well, but it was a fantastic way to get direction on the podcast, speakers, where to go. And what I found with these interviews is you're not going to be surprised by this, but it was an aha moment, which is women are very emotional around the financial decisions that they make. And a lot of these decisions stem from something in their background as a child, whether it was an experience or whether it was the way they were raised. And that really was what created the idea of Money Confident Girls. Mm. And so the podcast is Women on Wealth. And it's money confident girls. Yes. Clearly, I sense a pattern. You could have done children broadly. You could also have done, you know, humans on wealth. Like, you, so, so why, why women for the yes. podcast, and then why girls for the book? The women one for me was interesting with the podcast because in all of the years that I was educating uh, and running around the Northeast. 
and educating individuals about the markets, women constantly told me that that was not where they had confidence and that they were not the ones managing money. They were leaving it to their spouse. So for, for some reason, that was an easy decision for me. The book was completely different. I actually didn't start that way. I started with children in general. And I remember you telling our writing group that we needed to create some type of niche and we needed to focus on one, you know, think of one person. I remember you saying this and candidly, I thought that was a little crazy. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't understand that. And, and I kept thinking, no, that's not what I'm, that's not the way I'm thinking. But in my writing group, when every time we got together and we were talking about what we were writing, the group very quickly said, Jelena, you keep talking about girls. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you know, I have two girls. So that that's one reason that I, I kept leaning that way. But I think the other reason that I did is because I really do truly believe women need to have more of a financial awareness um, than ever before. And I think the fir first podcast I created was 90 percent. I will never go back and listen to it because I'm talking to myself. <laughs> but it sounds really cheesy to me. But the, the purpose of 90 percent is that 90 percent of women at one point in their life will be responsible for their own finances, whether it's the death of a spouse, whether it's a divorce. And, and most often that responsibility comes on them at a time when they least expect it. And so that was that was kind of what drove me to, I really wanna focus on educating girls in particular. So, and I'm sure I'll get some type of criticism for it. Candidly, anyone, any child it, it would resonate with, but but to me, I wanted to target girls. I was actually going to bring up that point is that when we think about books and we think about messaging broadly, like we, even the podcast, right? Women on wealth that very clearly speaks to who this is for rather than just being, it could just be on wealth, right? Yes. Like that could be the name of, but like, what does that mean? Whereas yes. women on wealth is just so much more clear and same thing with money, confident girls, but anyone can listen to this podcast and anyone can read this book, yes. right? And so there's such a benefit to that. Absolutely. I know men that listen to the podcast. I know ma male financial advisors that listen to the podcast. And I think it's great. I even think it's great that they tell me that. But I think what the point you bring up is a very valid one. Yeah. And if we kind of like go back in time a little bit and just try to identify, and I'm, I'm sure you've discussed this on a podcast episode in the past, but how you entered finance to begin with. And, and like, we kind of know the origin, you know, of starting at this new firm and saying, okay, I want to start a podcast, but how did you get into finance to, to begin with? So I think there were two moments for me that almost happened back to back in, in my memory. Uh, <laughs> and they were both around the time that I was going from high school to college. So the first was a conversation with my mom when we were applying for colleges and you think about the college process, you need to, you need to put down your parents' income. And I remember my mom giving me the income and I was a little surprised to hear how much money she made. She was very successful in real estate. She spent a lot of time in pursuit of that career. And I, I made a comment to her and her response was, well, you need to make as much money as your husband in case you divorce him. <laughs> and, and as harsh, I think, as that was, she did, she did, my parents did divorce actually several months later. So wow. it was certainly top of mind. And she will deny that she said this, but I remember that very clearly. And, and mm -hmm. so, you know, 50% of us, you know, in this, in this country will divorce with current rates, with the current, um, excuse me, the current divorce rate. The second one happened right after, and it was my grandmother and my grandmother, my grandparents were, um, were very well to do in North Carolina. My grandfather was chief of staff for a hospital in Asheville. And she had no reason to really want to understand finance, but she knew she needed to. Mm -hmm. And she acknowledged that one day to me when we were cleaning out her office, I found this Rolodex. And she said, your grandfather may pass away before I do. And I really need to understand the finances. Wow. And that really stuck with me. And he did. He passed away. He passed away um, many years before my grandmother. And I think those two together, you talk about what I just mentioned with the 90%, whether it's longevity or divorce. I don't realize I didn't realize how much of an impact that had on me, but I remember graduating college just thinking very adamantly, I need to be in finance. Mm. And it took me years later to figure out to figure out why. But I think that was, I think looking back, that was what it was. Wow. I feel like that's so powerful because I don't know that most of us can pinpoint an exact conversation or an exact moment where that shift or that aha happened. And it sounds like such a powerful lineage of women to like in the case of your mother, just being a money confident woman, right? right. 
raising a money confident girl, but then thinking about your grandmother, just the self-awareness yes. of knowing that this is something that she needed to 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 be mindful of. Because I imagine this is a number of years ago. So like you add on like what's happening today versus 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, like all very different scenarios. I think for me, it's very easy to look back at late high school, early college. To me, it was a very emotional, very emotional time. Your parents are getting divorced. You're you're trying to decide what you're doing with your life, getting into college. The whole, I think that's the reason it really stuck with me. Mm, it's really powerful. And I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, but having these nuggets of wisdom, gems, if you will, from a mother, a grandmother, a, I think many people can't say that that's ever happened, right? Because I think that you can speak to this and probably have episodes about this of like just the lack of financial education from parent to child, which is yes. clearly the crux of your book. But from a, a mindset standpoint, right? Because for you, that seed was planted. And for yeah. others, that seed isn't planted. So I would did that shift shape your mindset around how you looked at money even back then? That's a good question. And I feel like after being in finance for 25 years, I think the first 20 years, I didn't realize how much I had emotions and habits that created my own financial decisions. Mm -hmm. It really has been over the last few years interviewing women and understanding how they think about it that I've begun to acknowledge that I had my own. And I think one of my one of my earliest memories, and my mom can't believe I still remember this, it was when I was six years old. We lived in South America and we did a two week venture into the depths of the Amazon. We were on the border of three countries, no food, no water. Everything was in our car. And when I tell you we witnessed extreme poverty, it was mind boggling. Right. Some of these communities that we went into with no running water, you know, kids don't have clothes on. And I, for some, that really, really stuck with me. So when people talk about poverty, that's what I think of. Mm. And to this day, I still get, I still get a ton of anxiety about, are we going to run out of money? Are we, you mm. know, I, and it's interesting. And I hear that from, I hear that from families, even very well-to-do families that just have this anxiety around it. And I think a lot of it sometimes is based on an experience or an emotion of, of how they grew up. And so for me, that's one of them. So, you know, we're just coming off the holidays. I always get anxiety around the holidays, right? You see the credit card inch up, you're spending more money on food and drink. And, and my, you know, my girls were making fun of me. They're like, there goes mom again. She's getting, she's getting nervous. <laughs> and I just, that's my nature. And I've, I've become to, I've come to acknowledge that that's something I will always have. And it's so interesting and relatable, right? Like it's broadly relatable, but then also the fact that you're in finance and also and still experience this, I feel like is very humbling in a way where it's like, okay, Julina's like a professional in this space and still gets anxious around the holidays. I feel like that's just such a freeing statement for people to hear. I really do. Ask my <laughs> husband. <laughs> oh, the joys, the, the joys of the, the matriarch of the family. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, you were saying- Kind of that experience when you were young and and seeing this level of poverty, I would imagine that not not as many people can say that they traveled to another country where there was extreme poverty to have like firsthand witnessed it. But are there other things that people are parents will just frame it that way are saying to children that are kind of maybe creating that uncertainty or that lack of confidence? Like I think of the phrase like money doesn't grow on trees. Right. Yes. Like, is that, I would imagine that's probably detrimental or harmful in some way, but I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah. And that's actually one of the phrases I put in the book. Cause that's one that I grew up with. I heard that all the time. Money doesn't grow on trees and we don't live in a barn. And so it is interesting. And I, and some of the, some of the individuals that I interviewed are like me, they take that and they sort of run with it themselves. I'm the one running around the house, turning off all the lights Mm -hmm. And I, I will say the same thing that I was that I was told growing up. There are others that will actually go and pivot the complete opposite way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting to see how everyone handles those phrases and those experiences that they had growing up. I mm -hmm. I don't know what the correlation or that's not the right word. I don't know how individuals come to that decision, but it is interesting that some follow it and some completely divert and go a different way. I find that interesting. And it's a, a conversation my partner and I have often when we talk about food. 
where I grew up where you didn't waste food. She grew up where you don't waste food. And yet I will make sure that I do everything I can to make sure whatever's in the fridge is used. And for yes. her, she, and I'm like, I have to like, to, to make sure that I'm not wasting this. And for her, she's like, I now have the benefit where I don't have to worry about that. So if it goes bad, it goes bad. And those are yeah. two completely different mindsets, but the root of the, of the, the source of the issue is the same. I find that just completely fascinating on such a, a very random example. No, I, I think about that all the time because I'm exactly like you. I have to use every last thing. I will, I will push those leftovers to the point that I can Mm -hmm. And and it's interesting because I think part of it is, again, going back to, you know, your experiences as a child, my grandparents were very influential on me. I lived with them for for a long time in North Carolina in the summers. And again, they were well to do. But I remember my grandfather taking us to McDonald's and stealing the sugar packets. Mm. You know, so I don't know what to make of that, but. For some reason, I've just, I've always had that stinginess too, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think it I is. Don't steal, I don't steal sugar <laughs> packets, <laughs> but I, but I you have extra ketchup packets. You're not going to throw them away. No, exactly. So like, it just, you should see what I save in the office here after. Yeah. Oh my God. Same thing with like um, plastic cutlery that comes from something. I will save that too. Cause I also, from an environmental standpoint, just hate the single use plastic, but yeah, I just, I find it interesting, like where we how how our stinginess potentially shows up in the influence from our parents of of where that came from. Like I know for me, it was my dad. My mom was the spender. My dad was the the stingy person. Like I know that that's where it came from. You could have gone either way, right? Sure, could have. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's so interesting. It really is. And so if, in this vein, if we're thinking about like, because we're talking about kind of the the baggage, if you will, that we are yeah. carrying from childhood. But how do we flip that and encourage? In this case, again, money con- confident girls. How do we encourage girls to just be more financially independent, maybe without the baggage that we as adults or parents or caregivers might be accidentally or inadvertently putting on them? Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the one of the themes of the book is a starting early, start as early as you can. And someone even joked with me, if your child is no longer trying to swallow coins you need to start finding ways to have this conversation. And it's subtle messaging. And I think that it's rather building the foundation and the building blocks of what they're going to learn over time, right? It's like learning math. You've got to learn your addition and your subtraction before you learn your algebra. But we have to start as early as possible. And and I write this in the book. One of the reasons I think it's so important, especially for girls, is children lose confidence at such an early age. And girls by research, lose it earlier than boys. Mm -hmm. So I think it's great that high schools are trying to focus on financial education. Connecticut, as you and I talked about, finally is mandating a course in high school. Unfortunately, I think it's too late. And I think it needs to start much earlier. And we can't rely on the educational system. It has to come from the family orbit, whether it's the parents, the guardians, grandparents, uncles. it, It really does need to start early. And it can be very, very simple. Yeah. And I think that's what makes your book really powerful because even if someone, you know, even if there's someone listening to this and they don't themselves have a child or a girl, right? It's such a good book to gift to someone in your life, whether it maybe it's a, a, you know, it's a niece or, you know, somebody just a like a family, familial niece, but then also like friends of yours that might have uh, young children. Like it's just, it's such a perfect book to give to others, not to just be like, I have to have a daughter in order for this to book, this book to make sense because the, the information is just so broadly applicable. And to your point, like starting young, like how amazing would it be of not that you'd give it to a, a three-year-old, but like give it as a gift to a parent or a guardian or whomever it is when their child turns three to like, just have this, th- like thinking about this now, because that's when the, the difference is going to be made. Yes. And, and I think I was very intentional on targeting the parents, guardians, whoever it may be over the child itself and, and writing a kid's book, because we, the financial literacy in this country today is so low and candidly it is around the world. And I, in a lot of it, you look at adults today that don't know how to manage their own money. And a lot of it comes down to the basics. Most adults don't know how to budget. And so the idea was if if we can help educate the next generation, but at the same time, maybe give some nuggets 
to the parents along the way for themselves, then, um, then I will call that a win. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely seems like there's lots of, lots of opportunity here. And that kind of brings me into the idea of like strategy. So are there specific strategies when you're thinking about whether it's being mindful around your money or budgeting or whatever it is that are both relevant to the adult, but then also to the, to girls, children, a younger audience? Yeah. So the three areas that I try to, um, target in the book around the building blocks are your saving, your spending, and your investing. So those are the three that I kind of walk through specifically, and you can go much further. But again, I wanted to keep it simple. So when you think of like spending, it's you can teach a child at a very young age, it's your wants versus your needs, right? Do you need this or do you want this? And you can do that in a store. And eventually they will learn that you need to think of long-term goals versus immediate gratification. Mm-hmm. So that that's one idea. The other one is the power of saving. And, you know, we talk about, you know, everyone has a piggy bank. Everyone gets a piggy bank at some point in their life, or it could be another savings tool, but that eventually turns into the idea of a budget. If you keep building on that block, right, you start to create and understand what does it mean to budget? How much are you allocating to saving versus spending, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And then the last one is, is investing. And I try to put in the book some great examples from parents around how they tried to um, raise their kids and teach them about investing along the way. Cause that's, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm actually going through it personally myself with my girls. And so I try to share as many ideas as I can in the book that are not just mine. (laughs) Yeah. But, But I think those are the three powerful ones. Yeah. And it's such a simple, like there's such simple buckets to think about saving, spending, investing. Right. However you define those things, they're very simple. Yes. This is, this is meant to be very, very simple. Anyone Mm -hmm. can have this conversation early on and everyone should. Yeah. And so the saving and spending, I think are the easier topics, right? Like that's, and like you were just saying, like, even now you're trying to figure this out with your own family for the investing side. So do you have specific advice for, again, parents, caregivers, whomever with their daughters or children about investing and like wealth building. Yeah. So my example with what I'm going through personally with myself, I have an investment account for both of my girls and they're not managing it, but I did want them to start to have ownership and understand what that looks like in that investment account. So I asked each of them, if you could pick one company that you really like, that you believe will continue to grow over time, what would it, what would that be? Mm. So my younger one chose Amazon mm-hmm. and she's like, and this was the pandemic mom, Amazon is at our front door every day. And so that's great. So I bought her some Amazon and I I'm trying, this is the struggle I'm having now because the interest is candidly not there mm-hmm. and every child is different, but I just want to keep nudging mm-hmm. and show her that that price goes up and down mm-hmm. over time, but that she starts to understand that that's how a stock moves over time. You have yeah. this volatility along the way. And so that was my way of introducing it, but there are some interesting stories in there of, of how others did it as well. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Cause I feel like the lack of interest, like that, that definitely is a hurdle, but yeah. at some point later in life, she will thank you. It's just, it might be a while. It, exactly. And I want, I want her, I am fine with her being frustrated at this point mm-hmm. in the hopes that going forward, when she finally has a moment, she goes, okay, now I got it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I remember going through that with my own father. He taught me how to balance a check checkbook. Mm-hmm. And I remember being, being so frustrated at the kitchen counter that he was making me sit down and go through this. You will make fun of me, but I still balance my checkbook to this day. Mm-hmm. I still have to physically write everything out because that turned into be such a powerful habit for me. Yeah. And so, but again, I, I was not appreciative of it at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I have, um, I don't even know what to call it. It's right here on my desk though. It's a a budget planner and it's one of the, oh, my, my lighting is terrible, but. Um, oh, yeah. oh yeah. And it just, it has like your monthly budget. Did I meet my goals? Did I save what my expenses were? And I find it 
good to write it out too, yes. because it forces you to actually look at a credit card statement to say, like, I pay the balance off every month, but you, you're not really paying attention to, yes. you're just, it's coming in, you're paying it, you're coming in. And so it makes you have to actually have to look to say, was that necessary? Or, oh, wow, I spent a little bit more on food this month than necessary or, or whatever it is. So I also feel like just the, the physical act of writing can be a different experience than in a spreadsheet or just not looking at it at all. No, absolutely. And, and I think it really is just giving kids the awareness of it. And then in the hopes that going forward, as they build, build their own financial responsibility and their own financial independence, they create their own habits from it. They mm -hmm. may be identical or they may completely transition to something else, but hopefully it's something positive mm -hmm. that they gain from it. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is that I do know a number of people who are advisors and I have seen a pattern of physically balancing a checkbook still. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. I wonder yeah. what that's about. Hmm. I am a visual person. Same. I need, I need to <laughs> physically write it. I still handwrite my notes. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. just, that's just the way I. Yeah. That's just the way I work. It's always so interesting. I still handwrite, um, like if someone refers business to me, I still handwrite a check because um, I feel like it just feels more personal, feels more meaningful rather yep. than just having it, you know, auto go through yep. whatever system in your bank. Yep. Yeah. That's so funny. interesting how we all are, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the nuances. Oh, I know. <laughs> so if we're thinking about kind of going a little bit deeper here, just thinking about kind of critical skills, is it... Are there critical thinking skills, financial skills, or tools that you would encourage young girls to develop to kind of set them up for a, a better or different future? Yeah, so I, I tried to break the book into a, a few different pieces, and, and the middle of the book is focusing on tools for the kids. So mm -hmm. we spend time talking, uh, you know, we talk about the piggy banks and the savings mm -hmm. tools. I have an entire section on allowance that that is a hot topic for every parent. Uh, mm -hmm. My husband and I have been arguing about allowance for a while as to what's the right way to do it. And, and, and it's funny because we're both in finance and that, that was another aha moment with the book. I'm like, there's two of us in finance and we don't know the right answer. And I think that's one of the points of the book is I don't I'm not trying to give you a right answer but I'm trying to give you ideas from all of these successful parents and how they did it. And so those are probably the two biggest tools. And then the back end of the book, I have tools for parents that they should be doing themselves to set the stage for their kids mm -hmm. with meaning different types of accounts that they should be considering and opening for their kids over time. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Cause I would imagine because there isn't a lot of financial literacy out there to know what type of accounts you should be setting up. And I know that you go to the gas station and there's like a a college savings plan ad on the gas pump. And like, who knows if that is actually the right thing to put your money in for your kid or not. Yes. So how do people know, like, how do people, well, obviously there's the resource in the book, but what type of, a, a you know, like debit cards are all the rage now, right? Like before it was just giving your kid cash, that was allowance. And now there's like debit card options. Like what is the, like, is there something that parents should be considering and thinking about right now? Yeah. And it was, I have a whole section in there talking about the debit cards because they're changing. They've changed so fast. Mm. Right. And so to your, to your point, my girls don't carry money at all. Mm -hmm. And these debit cards are amazing because if you want to save, if you want to invest in these cards, you can use, you can use them to do that. You know, instantaneously, if your child spends money at Rite Aid, mm -hmm. right. I, as soon as I see an, a pop-up on my phone from Rite Aid from Sydney, mm -hmm. I know she's buying candy. Yeah. And so it's a great way to track. You can send money to them instantly. And so I do talk about the importance of these debit cards. Mm -hmm. I, they are, again, they're changing so fast. I'll be interested to see what they offer five years from now. Yeah. But I also think to your point, I do really spend a lot of time and attention on 529 plans for college. I actually highlight that last saying, this is the first thing you should be doing mm -hmm. of anything in the book, which um, if you think about it, you have a child, the last thing you're thinking of is the fact that they're going to college immediately, mm -hmm. right? You're worried about bringing them home in the baby carrier and mm -hmm. the type of diapers, et cetera. The 529 has to be instant. And mm -hmm. so when I talk about the importance of letting that money grow tax deferred yeah. for 17, 18 years and what that can do, 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I do also highlight custodial accounts and, um, and believe it or not, Roth IRA as well. Those are a few others that I think have surprised people that are in the book. Yeah. I just started exploring a Roth for my son. So yeah, yeah. it's, I'm like, I didn't even, didn't even know that was an option. So it's good to have people who know what they're doing around you and books yeah. like yours. <laughs> it, exactly. And I think it is funny. Most individuals think that a Roth, that with a Roth IRA, you have to be an adult Mm-hmm. put money away. You just have to have earned income. Yeah. So yeah. I love so it. So interesting. So interesting. And I think that that to me, that's what's beautiful about your book because you have it synthesized in such a way that feels accessible because any one of these chapters, topics, sub a, a single paragraph in your book could be an entire book on its like on its own, right? Or you might need an entire designation to be able to sell a product that supports a paragraph in your book, right? Because there's just such a level of complexity around, but it just simplifies things in such a way that makes it accessible to the average person to say, you know what? I want to raise a money confident girl and I just need to pick this book up to make that happen. Yeah, I I appreciate that because I you as you know, um, the, the original version of this was like a dissertation. <laughs> it was, I have piles and piles of research um, over to my my left and I, I still look at it. It's it's pretty funny, but I completely with you, with the help of you and your team, that was um, that I moved away from that. And and I do want anyone, anyone to be able to pick this book mm-hmm. up and understand it and find nuggets to to use from it. That was the goal. Yeah. And so what is your hope, right? So let's fast forward to this episode is aired, which means your book is out, you know, people are picking up, like, what is the thing that you're hoping that uh, somebody is going to come up to you and say, I read this book and it did this for me? My hope is that the next generation has more financial responsibility, financial knowledge, financial independence, right? Than our generation and the ones ahead of us. And that ultimately that creates confidence, Mm -hmm. confidence in general, and just confidence that they can live their life. They can make independent decisions. They know what they're doing and that they can end up in retirement doing what they want to do. And they can do it with confidence because that's something I do not find very often in this role. And again, it, it can be anyone with any amount of money. Mm-hmm. The lack of confidence that I find is very frustrating and unsettling. And I would love to see the next generation handle that much better. Yeah, I think that's a great goal. And you were you were saying before at some point of, you didn't say generational wealth, but that's kind of how I interpret what you were saying about, you know, people who have, you know, they have, they have a lot of money and they still sometimes lack that confidence. Like, it's just kind of wild to think about that confidence. It doesn't matter how much, how little or how much you have. There's just a general lack of confidence around money. A hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why I love the title of your book. It's like, so, cause the word confident is just so perfect. It's such a good goal and an attainable goal. Cause if you can give a, give a child confidence in one area, in this case, finance, yeah. like in theory, you should be able to do that in other areas too. And it should be easier. Well, and I have to thank you as well, because you and your team helped me with that. <laughs> that was such a hard part of the process. I mean, and, and the tagline even was even harder. So, yeah. Oof. Yeah. But you were very willing to say, you know what? This isn't a dissertation. Let me scrap all this research. Right. Like you didn't go kicking and screaming. So that's, the, that's a benefit. Right. Because sometimes people kick and scream along the way and you did not. You were like, OK, what's the next hurdle we have to tackle? All right. We're not doing a dissertation. All right. Now we have to change the title. Now we have to change the subtitle. So, but what's great is that when you're open to collaboration, it just makes such a better product. And that's what I'm excited about for all of your listeners and anyone else in your network to take advantage of. Well, thank you. And I, again, your team was absolutely fantastic. I can't speak highly enough thank you. Um, about it. And as you and I were just talking about before getting on this, you know, I'm still in touch with a lot of the individuals in the group originally. And we're trying, we we're still collaborating and it's been, it's been such an amazing experience. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I can't wait to see what, uh, for anyone listening, who's in Connecticut, what Connecticut collaborations we might be able to come up with in this yeah. uh, coming yeah. year. <laughs> Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, thank you for allowing me to kind of, uh, take over your, your show today. This has been fun. This was, this was better than I expected. I was so anxious. So thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. Oh, I appreciate it.
And, and I guess last thing I will say is Jen, if anyone does want to learn more about you, where can they go? They can go to publishyourpurpose.com and all of my information is there. Anyone's welcome to contact me directly. I'm happy to, happy to have a conversation. Perfect. And I, I guess I should mention that my book will be available on my website, julinaoglevy.com and on Amazon. Sure will. And all the other places that people want to buy a book. Yay. Ooh, so exciting. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome.